Michael, are you leaving people in or are they free to join when they would like? They're free to join whenever they'd like. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so. so we'll just, yeah, we'll just give it one or two minutes, um, Raffaele, if you don't mind, and then we yeah. can kickstart. Okay, we'll get started. So welcome everyone to the first Stork event of the year. And we have Raffaele here today to speak to us about his paper on equivalence and non-inferiority testing. Um, so we can save a few of the questions for the end. Feel free to put them in the chat throughout or at the very end of the call, you can um, unmute yourselves and ask Raffaele some questions directly as well. Um, so Raffaele is a postdoc at the Department of Sports Science at the University of Innsbruck. Today he presents and discusses alternative statistical approaches to traditional null hypothesis testing that researchers can use to design and analyze experimental interventions when they are interested in different research questions from deciding whether an effect is present. So thank you um, for joining us, Raffaele, and looking forward to your talk. So, sorry. Thank you, Gianni. I would like to start this journal club in a perhaps unusual way. And that is telling you a story that some of you may already know. So there is this drunk man looking for something under street light. A policeman comes and asks him, what are you looking for? Then the drunk man replies, I'm looking for my quarter drop. Then the police ask, did you drop it here? No, I dropped two blocks down the street, replies the drunk man. Then why are you looking for it here? And then the drunk man replies, because here is where the light is. I began the story to stress a very important point. As human, we often try to solve problems in the easiest and most intuitive way for us, without caring if this is indeed the right or the most appropriate way. This is a bias, it's actually called street light effect. And this bias also occurs and affects many sports science scenarios. So probably as most of you already know, Inferential statistics about intervention efficacy in sports science are largely based on what is called traditional hypothesis testing, which some of you may also know as null hypothesis significance or statistical testing. This uh, uh, framework for decision making is actually a hybrid between the Fisher significance testing and the Neyman and Pearson acceptance testing, and uh, is based mostly on controlling error rates in the long term which basically mean in plain language, knowing not to be wrong in one direction or another more than a given number of time. The steps for traditional hypothesis tests are quite simple and I guess common for all of you. Pretty much you start by determining your error rates in terms of alpha and beta. Then you determine or pre-specify a null hypothesis, which generally means the absence of an effect with a given uh, probability distribution. Then you start collecting your data. And when you collect enough data, um, a desired power, you test the, the null hypothesis at the desired rate. Then if the probability of the excel of the effect you observe in your study is sufficiently unplausible or unlikely, which in plain language basically means less than alpha level you specify, then you can reject the null and accept the alternative. So, well, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, the point is this, although the null uh, hypothesis testing is widely used, uh, it has strong limitation. Uh, for example, this uh, test uh, pretty much that allow you to determine whether or not uh, two groups for experimental study are different and possibly even the directionality of such difference. However, uh, the fact that you can answer to these questions might not be your primary interest. Also because uh, uh, based uh, all your line of research and future career in testing whether or not a mere effort exists, might end up with promoting uh, intervention that are, uh, um, might be uh, invasive, very badly tolerated, costly, and might have even perhaps a trivial efficacy. Uh, two points. Actually, one point I forgot uh, from those of you who prefer a confidence interval approach, I have to stress that from a decision making standpoint, uh, rejecting the null whenever the P is less than your alpha is mathematically equivalent 
to um, accepting the alternative whenever the confidence interval constructs around the effect estimates with a level of one minus alpha or reject zero. You can, uh, in case you haven't, what I said is not much clear, you can, uh, uh, I guess, understand better by looking at the slides. In the first three cases, the confidence interval built around the FX sites, which for interventional studies mostly is uh, based on mean difference between intervention, um, exclude the zero line, which basically is, is the line where the two interventions should be at least ideally equal. Uh, in these three cases, we observe a p-value less than our alpha. In, in the fourth case, in the first scenario, uh, the confidence interval doesn't uh, exclude the, uh, the zero f and it actually includes zero and even negative f sites. In this case, we cannot conclude that the two interventions are different or one is superior to the other. Okay. Uh, and building on my previous discussions, I mean, about the fact that uh, aiming for a research design just to prove that the two interventions are simply different um, might not be much informative. Researcher, even sports scientist, might find more informative to investigate uh, whether one intervention is substantially better than the other one, but on a higher degrees of, of evidence. Um, for example, uh, a common approach that is actually used mostly in clinical research is called double criterion design and is mostly a combined approach that combines um, classical as uh, statistical difference with uh, um, oops, a FX size that is actually uh, what, is, what they call practically relevant, which basically means that uh, um, researcher wants a intervention that is uh, statistically superior to a control, a placebo, but also whose effect size in terms of observed effect estimate is larger than a certain cutoff, a certain value that researcher pre-specified as important or worthwhile. Um, the level of evidence can even be uh, increased and actually research might not uh, uh, be uh, willing to uh, aim just for an effect size that is larger than the, a, a small or less uh, effect of interest, but they may, may want that the entire uh, um, effect inferentially is statistically larger than that small or less effect of interest. This basically means aiming that not only the point estimate, but the entire confidence interval is larger than the smallest effect of interest. This is in uh, what is called uh, uh, point shift hypothesis uh, or uh, from uh, uh, a clinical perspective, minimum effect testing. Now you may be wondering, well, uh, it seems obvious that increasing the level of evidence to uh, declare an uh, intervention, new intervention, perhaps if Pikachu's is a good thing. Yeah, on the paper is a good thing. But uh, uh, we should keep in mind that uh, increasing the level of evidence, which basically means require higher level of evidence before drawing conclusion in terms of superiority or statistical difference has a cost. You might have uh, a perfectly designed intervention on paper, which may end up being completely unrealistic in a real world scenario, especially in a sport uh, uh, science scenario. So uh, again, my recommendation is uh, before starting to think uh, what you could uh, aim uh, in terms of optimal uh, inference, I would strongly suggest to take into account also the time and the resources you have to avoid, to uh, pre-specify uh, very nice uh, conservative analysis, uh, very uh, good um, um, sample sites and ending up uh, with uh, a study that they will be inconclusive on your main inferential goal. So, so far I've talked about superiority studies, where again, regardless of evidence you want to use, uh, share the goal of determining if one intervention is more efficacious than another. But other questions, other research questions might be more appropriate for interventions that are less invasive, maybe cheaper, or even simply better tolerated by individuals. Instead of asking whether a new intervention is better than a standard or control, even on different degree of evidence, we might ask whether one intervention, actually two interventions are similar in efficacy, or even perhaps 
whether the new intervention, especially if it's cheaper, less invasive, invasive, better tolerate, is not substantially worse than the current standard. Now, for many of you, or maybe perhaps few of you, uh, it might seem uh, obvious to declare the absence of an effect as a logical conclusion whenever you cannot reject the null in a traditional null hypothesis statistical testing. And uh, if you are part of those people who are convinced about this thing, you have to be aware that you are in a very huge group because this is a common statistical error as well as a logical fallacy that is shared in many a branch of sciences, not only for science. But what you have to uh, be aware about this, that again, uh, this is a fallacy. And the point, the reason, the main reason why this is a fallacy and a statistical error is that uh, in a traditional hypothesis testing, you assume the null, whatever your null is, true a priori. And you collect data to falsify that null. As probably Doug Alman teach us years ago, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. And if you really want to prove absence as one of your main aims, or perhaps your main aim, you need specific tests that can reject what in a null hypothesis statistical testing is called alternative hypothesis. Uh, the key message here is that often approaching the problem using traditional hypothesis testing is not the most appropriate way to ask the question, is not the most efficient way to get an answer, and often is not even what we are interested in. Taking inspiration from one of my favorite movies, Old Boy, my recommendation at this point of the presentation is ask yourself the right question at first. So uh, from a statistical standpoint, uh, it's worth mentioning that proving that two interventions are perfectly identical, which basically means that they're different is lines on the zero line, it's impossible. But what you can do is uh, testing whether the two interventions do not differ but more than a pre-specified amount, a range that is generally uh, determined by what we call equivalence margin. Uh, I will try to explain how to interpret this sort of uh, um, designs, starting from a confidence level approach, an estimation approach, because it's much more intuitive. And now I will explain what sort of test you can use. Well, from a confidence interval approach, the interpretation is very easy. And it is the following. If your entire confidence interval built around the difference between intervention is contained in the uh, equivalence domain or equivalence range, you might declare the two uh, intervention or the two condition as uh, um, equivalent. If uh, the confidence interval is not contained or just pass one or both margin, you cannot declare your intervention as equivalent. As you can see in this slide, uh, the <laughs> Criteria to declare two interventions or two condition equivalent only applies to the mid scenario. In the other two scenarios, you cannot declare the two intervention equivalents. Uh, sorry, I forgot one thing. Um, from a testing uh, approach, if you want to test whether two interventions are similar, are equivalent, there are several approaches. I will discuss in this meeting just the most commonly used which is actually the two one side test or TOS procedure. And this test is slightly more complicated than a traditional uh, statistical test, because uh, here basically you have to switch the null and the alternative and test data against the two margin. And uh, uh, since uh, you test data against the two margin and not against zero difference, with one side test uh, per margin, you have to um, use what is called intersection union principle, and you can declare um, equivalence only when both tests reject the effect larger than the limit you pre specify. Uh, in case uh, uh, you're wondering if the things I'm telling you are new, progressive, uh, uh, modern, or so on, not at all. Here I'm not trying to sell any new method. This is actually. Uh, well established, a well established approach in the American literature for at least, uh, to the best of my knowledge, 40 years. 
And also it has been widely applied and expanded in what uh, some of you know my social and behavioral science, other my of experimental psychology. However, the point is that probably most of you have never heard about this because until now, investigation equivalence uh, have not been a common practice at all among sports scientists. We have uh, limit uh, uh, their use, uh, perhaps uh, uh, in a very few cases, just uh, in measurement agreement um, research. For example, as alternative or a complementary approach to the probably much more known blood animal methods. Uh, I spoke, I discussed about equivalence testing. Now we like to approach non-inferiority uh, tests. And as I said in the previous slide, uh, if there is an interest and also a strong rationale, which is should be specified and determined a priori before starting the study, to investigate whether a given generally new intervention is not unacceptably worse than a standard, with no restriction to its maximal efficiency, just we are just caring about the minimum effect, uh, you might actually consider to use a non-inferior design. And just to make the things more practical, this is might be the case when, again, the most intervention is cheaper, safer, easier to implement, and less challenging than standard. In sports science, although uh, there are some things that might need checked before make a firm statement, I can think about several scenarios when you might uh, start uh, considering uh, to implement a, a non inferior test. For example, I might think about uh, um, simulate versus real altitude training. Uh, I might think about highly individualized versus more standardized training protocol. And of course, I may also think about standard exercise prescriptions against lower dose alternatives. Um, from a statistical standpoint, uh, uh, in a non inferior testing, you have the null that is shift on the negative side of the zero effect, which basically means, as you can see in the slides, it favors the control. It follows that when you apply the confidence interval approach, uh, you can conclude and declare non inferiority whenever the confidence interval, be it again uh, uh, around the difference in mean between intervention, is entirely contained in the uh, non inferior domain, or in other words, is uh, larger than the value that corresponds to the non inferiority margin. In these slides, you can, I guess, get a quite quick understanding of what I mean. For example, in the first case, uh, we have the lower uh, um, limit of the confidence interval that is uh, much lower than the um, non inferiority um, limit. And in this case, P comes larger than alpha, whatever our uh, um, alpha is. And in this case, we cannot declare non-inferiority. On the other hand, in the second and in, in, in the lower scenarios, uh, although uh, the confidence interval pass the zero point and in the mid scenario even is entirely included on the negative uh, um, part of that exercise, we can still conclude the non-inferiority because uh, the criteria is not the position of the effect sites compared to the zero line, is not the position of the confidence interval compared to the zero line, but is the position of the confidence interval compared to the non-inferiority line. This is a point I might uh, recall later because actually it's critical to understand that uh, uh, sometimes this uh, uh, domain uh, um, approaches may actually overlap and you may end up with uh, an intervention that from a non-inferiority standpoint is non-inferior to the standard or to the comparator, but from a classical superiority standpoint is indeed inferior. Uh, I won't go deeper in these aspects. Uh, for those of you who want to get more information, there is plenty of literature and hopefully we cover briefly this aspect also in our review. This is just to say that uh, from a naive perspective, non-inferiority doesn't exclude inferiority. You might face some sort of uh, apparently paradoxical scenario, which has a very uh, specific uh, reason from a statistical standpoint, but still from a naive perspective, they might look uh, absurd and contradictory. So, okay. Yeah, a couple of things I would like to uh, stress here. Although I started praising the um, qualities and the 
uh, properties of uh, the use of these new approaches to investigate our research aim. We have also to keep our feet on the floor, on the ground, and be aware that uh, equivalence and non-inferiority tests already include all the challenges that traditional hypothesis testing has, plus others. Specifically, they uh, have, speci especially for the non-inferiority approach, you face three main additional challenges compared to the classical superiority or uh, standard testing approach, which are the choice, the selection of the reference intervention, the selection of the non-inferiority margin, and finally, also some issues that involve the proper sample size estimation. Again, uh, these uh, major uh, challenges pertain to non-inferiority uh, studies. Some of them also partly apply to equivalent studies. I will discuss them in the next lecture, in the next slide, sorry. Starting from the choice of the comparator, which actually probably is uh, one, if not the most critical aspect to have a valid and strong non-inferiority test. From a clinical perspective, and I will focus on clinical perspective because non-inferiority studies are mostly uh, performed in biomedical research, different from equivalent studies that have uh, also a widespread use in uh, psychology and social and behavioral science. I would say from a clinical perspective, the non-inferiority of a new experimental intervention cannot be concluded, actually can be concluded only when compared to a reference intervention of established efficacy. With established efficacy, uh, uh, I mean an intervention that has a strong evidence of efficacy from previous research. Again, here there are many interpretations of this uh, meaning. I would like to use the most uh, uh, used one, the most, uh, um, yeah, the most used one, which basically refers to a effect of intervention that has a strong effect that has confirmed in well-conducted meta-analysis and possibly also a reasonably low heterogeneity intranic effect. So this is one of the first characteristic. And uh, building on this characteristic, I should also stress that the design of the reference intervention, the one you are going to compare with your new intervention, should also replicate as close as possible in terms of population criteria, intervention protocol, primary, primary outcome measure, and so on, the characteristic of the intervention uh, that has been established in literature. These two things uh, are uh, um, needed to um, reduce, if not minimize, uh, the risk of what is called constancy assumption, which uh, is not much a statistical assumption, but rather a methodological assumption, which actually require that uh, you find consistency in effect uh, between the effect of the reference group, uh, the uh, comparator, the standard comparator in your study, and the historical effect that comparator has proving until that point. You might probably anticipate that uh, you won't be able to uh, check, uh, investigate this uh, uh, cons consistency in effect uh, until you see the results of your study. And the answer is yes. And that's the reason why actually you should uh, uh, work and, uh, and minimize the, this risk a priori, picking up uh, an intervention that has the strongest evidence for efficacy. Yeah. Ah, by the way, important premise. Uh, just this first step, the fact that you are building an inferiority study on intervention that uh, has some sort of doubtful efficacy might compromise all, all, all the next steps. So this is the first critical step. Without an intervention of proven efficacy, uh, you should strongly uh, um, think if uh, your non-inferiority study is appropriate. So once a basal intervention of proven efficacy has been detected and established, the next step uh, is determine the choice uh, of the non-inferiority margin. Again, here there are different uh, um, perspectives, different viewpoints, but uh, most of them agree on a critical um, principle that uh, the appropriate non-inferiority margin, regardless the method you choose to find it, should uh, be based on statistical consideration and domain expertise. Uh, and the general principle, this is an, a principle that is generally shared across uh, uh, researchers and statisticians with different view, is that uh, um, as a minimum criteria, you should uh, ensure 
that uh, uh, the margin of the non-inferiority is not greater, basically I mean in the negative direction, than the minimal effect you would expect for the reference intervention compared to placebo. Again, this comes back to the topic of meta-analysis. And in fact, the most to use, widely used approach to uh, determine the non-inferiority margin are both based uh, or at least largely based on the meta-analytic point estimate and meta-analytic confidence interval. These two approaches are called point estimation or point entry estimate method and fixed margin method. The difference, as I said, they are both based on picking up information from a well-conducted and solid meta-analysis. The difference is that, that the point estimation method does not consider uncertainty surrounding the meta-analytic effect size. It just picks up the effect size, the meta-analytic effect size, and he use it to determine the margin. Whereas the um, uh, fixed margin method is much is conservative, much more conservative in certain scenario where the number of uh, studies in the meta-analysis is low and the individual effect estimates within study is large, like in case of sports science. And basically it uh, uses uh, the lower bound of the confidence interval build around the meta-analytic effect estimates to uh, determine your, uh, your effect size. Uh, I have to stress a point here to uh, highlight a point that uh, some researchers, not all, actually the, this is kind of controversial topic, prefer to add a further discounted approach that applies uh, additionally to the uh, fixed margin or the point estimation method. And this approach is called a uh, preserve fraction, which basically is kind of intuitive. They basically uh, determine a, wait, I have this, my, okay. They basically determine a percentage of the historical FX size estimates that they want, they would like at least to be preserved by the new intervention compared to the, uh, compared to the standard in the new study. And to do that, they simply uh, fix the term in a percentage of the margin, and they reduce, shrink the margin of the percentage. There is, again, I'm not uh, a support, uh, supporter of uh, um, convention, but uh, uh, when we face reality, we have to admit it, and there is a strong convention, at least in clinical research, that this preserved fraction generally is about 50% of the historical effect uh, estimates. Some research may use 33, 66, other percentages, but if you make a brief uh, look uh, through uh, clinical literature, you will see that uh, the flexibility in this uh, percentage uh, that is applied to determine the, re the retention fraction is not uh, much uh, uh, large. We always see those one, two, three values that are systematically repeated. Probably this is also a reason why several biostatisticians criticize the choice of preserved fractions, because uh, it's perhaps a topic that also applied to universal uh, uh, minimal clinical important difference, is that they criticize the fact that uh, that given preserved fraction fits for all the populations. And some of them also goes further, they criticize the choice, the method of implementing a preserved fraction as a discount, as effective discounted approach. So uh, actually, a preserved fraction is not uh, a uh, universally agree uh, methods to uh, be implemented in the paths you use uh, to determine your non-inferiority margin. Uh, okay, yeah, um, some very brief history. Uh, by, as I said earlier, uh, bioequivalence, actually it's uh, more commonly defined as bioequivalence in clinical research are uh, um, um, often used but differently from uh, non-inferiority studies have much less flexibility in the determination of the margin. As uh, you probably have realized from the slides, the determination of the margin is an issue. It's actually a double issue, even when you aim to uh, conduct uh, equivalence testing or equivalence studies. But uh, the point is that uh, in most uh, of the clinical literature, especially for bioequivalence studies, which is mostly uh, are extremely common in that field that is called pharmacodynamics, uh, those uh, limits are highly regulated by uh, agencies like FDA, um, EMA, and so on. So there is not much flexibility in that choice. 
which on the one hand simplified the, the topic from a research perspective. On the other, uh, it has, of course, some sort of limitation because basically you standardize a given percentage or a given value for different population. Yeah, but uh, uh, um, on the other hand, uh, the situation, the scenario is much more flexible and from my st standpoint, it's interesting in um, social and behavioral science where actually there are several methods that might also be involved. The resources, you, you already know that you can allocate to investigate the deficits to determine the equivalence margin. I won't go much in deep in this aspect, but I would recommend you to read the, um, the works by Daniel Lackens, which uh, wrote a lot about the different approaches you can use to um, determine equivalence margin in uh, social and behavioral science. Um, okay. Yeah, I forgot the slide. I briefly show in the slides the, um, the different uh, methods. Okay. So we move to the last step, and which involved sample size estimation. Well, from a um, methodological perspective, non inferiority and superiority study as logically opposite test. And it comes that uh, the approach to determine sample sites in uh, um, non inferiority and superiority study follow the same principle. The only difference uh, stays in the uh, sites of the effect you are going to expect. It. Whereas uh, in classical superiority studies, you base your sample sites on the difference between the, the zero point, uh, which defines the, the null difference between intervention, and the expected uh, effect sites or the minimum effect sites you aim to investigate and so on. In non-inferiority uh, studies, you actually uh, shift this uh, uh, delta and you define your sample size based on the difference between your established non-equivalence, non-inferiority margin, and usually the zero difference. Since the, this uh, uh, delta for non-inferiority studies is usually much reasonably too much smaller than a superiority difference, you generally pre-specify superiority studies, it comes that uh, in many cases, non-inferiority studies require bigger, larger sample size, of course, or less being equal than a classical superiority test. But, and there is a but, which is actually make a little but critical difference. If you have a sufficient data or intuition on a rational to expect a larger effect of your new intervention, new experimental intervention compared to the standard, you might actually consider to uh, including this expected difference, which is larger than zero, in determination in, in, in the uh, determination of your of your margin. In this case, uh, especially when this difference is large, the sample size for non inferiority studies can be actually substantially smaller than for a traditional superiority study. Actually, I have a work example, I don't want to spare too much later, that show you how actually uh, studies that fail to prove uh, um, superiority may actually be uh, uh, Reinvestigate, of course, just for didactical uh, purposes, because originally you should, set, you should set your aim a priori and a posteriori. And you can show how that if the original counter will have specified an inferiority hypothesis, they will actually be able to uh, declare superiority. Sorry, non inferiority. So, uh, for what instead concern the equivalence testing in terms of sample size estimation, I have to make a premise that uh, uh, since the TOST procedure uh, requires that both tests are uh, significant, which basically means that the rejected effect larger than the, the limits, it comes that uh, the power to, uh, of, to perform a properly TOST procedure to investigate equivalence is simply equal to the power of the one tail test against the smaller margin, which is the mar margin closer to zero effect. In case, of course, the margin is asymmetric, because in many cases, uh, researchers specify symmetric margin, and in that case, uh, this issue is not a problem. Uh, but since, again, since uh, um, equivalence tests have small margin and a small margin in both directions, actually the issue of sample sites, especially if you want to um, approach the uh, sample site estimations from a clinical perspective, uh, may end up with uh, uh, requiring much larger sample to prove equivalence than to prove a classical superiority. 
And I like, I like, uh, I want to stress this point because actually this is, I would say, contradictory, if not paradoxical, to the common feeling that we might use uh, uh, lack of statistical significance often as a result of properly uh, and properly powered inferential test to declare equivalence. It's not like this, it's not like this at all. If, you, if your study uh, cannot uh, uh, detect a significant difference when you uh, design the study with expected uh, difference of intervention, I highly doubt your study might even getting close to uh, detect a similarity equivalence between the, 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 the two, two interventions you're testing. Because the key message is simple. Proving, designing a study to prove equivalence uh, is uh, demanding. And this should be taken into consideration when uh, uh, you plan the studies. Uh, of course, uh, uh, now you may be wondering, uh, all this is nice, but uh, if, I'm really, if you really convince me to at least explore this pet, what should I do? What, should, what can I use? What cool tool can I use to uh, at least have an idea about uh, how big these sample sizes need to be? Well, it comes that there are plenty of material, again, mostly from clinical uh, research and social and behavioral science. I um, posted some of the most interesting paper on the topic in the slide, and also web-based application that can help you to get, as I said, at least a general estimate of how big your samples need to be to start the study which you are aiming to investigate equivalence or non-inferiority. Uh, so I mo Sorry, I have the monitor that went. Okay, I mostly cover the theoretical points. Now I would like to uh, present you a work example on published literature to give you a proper perspective on the topic. Remise, uh, especially because I had bad experience in the past, this example doesn't want to be at all a negative critic to the outer works, but it should serve to show the potential area of application of non inferior design in sports science. And hopefully, this example should also promote the use of this, of this non inferior design in future research when applicable and appropriate, of course. And I would also like to add that I pick up this example because I think that this example, this sort of uh, group interventions are one of those scenarios that might benefit the most from the implementation of non inferior hypothesis. So, I don't know how many of you are uh, um, familiar with sprint interval training. For those of you who are not much in the area, I will just make a brief introduction. Sprint interval training is a form of high intensity interval training, which basically involves near to maximal and maximal sprints uh, performed for a few seconds, 10, 20, sometimes even 30 seconds, interspersed by, separated by prolonged recovery periods. What I mean with prolonged, here in this case, it was two minutes, but it can go up until three, four, generally even more sometimes. And compared to the classical moderate intensity training, what you might call as aerobic training, it requires much less time. And actually, this is the critical component that makes a difference, at least from my perspective, between these two forms of training. You pay an effort, but again, <laughs> At the end of the week, uh, you are uh, uh, accumulating, you are spending, at least for the, this design, a ninth of the time. And these characteristics, when we think uh, out of uh, proving efficacy, effectiveness, and so on, we should also uh, realize that these characteristics uh, makes the use of sprint interval training, especially with this design, appealing for a part, which might be a substantial part of the population that is willing to perform some sort of exercise or aerobic exercise to improve his general health, but doesn't want at the same time to dedicate several hours per week to achieve that goal. Yeah, of course, we might use a strict uh, philosophy and say they don't want it, it's their fault. On the other hand, we might even try to investigate whether we can find uh, a train intervention that might actually help them to reach uh, to train reach their aim 
improving the health, and I don't want to be cynic, but in turn, decreasing the health cost. So what this author did in, in this study was uh, uh, actually comparing um, moderate continuous intensity training, sprint interval training between them and against the control. They implemented these forms of training for 12 weeks, I guess, and they compare at 6, 12, as again, between them and against control. What they found was that both form of training, both at six weeks, at least at mid-term and post-term, are significantly uh, more effective in improving VO2 max than control. And in, in terms of superiority, they can uh, properly conclude that uh, regardless the uh, method, the training method you use, you will face uh, a substantial, actually significant improvement in your uh, VO2, VO2 peak, which is uh, often used at one of the, one of the index uh, of cardiorespiratory fitness. However, uh, the point is that uh, is not about uh, the uh, interpretation from a superiority standpoint. Is that uh, in the conclusion they focus uh, on the comparison between the two training interventions, and they actually declare that the benefits of the two training intervention was similar. I guess here. Yeah actually the same extent. This is a, actually a equivalent statement. And I guess uh, if I read correctly, I remember correctly, this statement, I guess, was based on the fact that both interventions were more effective than the standard and the point estimate was similar for V2 max. Uh, I won't go deeper to discuss why using this uh, uh, Comparison is not uh, an appropriate way to uh, determine difference between intervention. But what I would like to say is that uh, we could actually uh, reanalyze these studies in order to uh, put more emphasis on the difference of the comparison between on the proper comparison between the, uh, the two intervention. Okay, and to do that, uh, we should actually discard the control group. Actually, the original slide was for moving the control, I guess. I miss something in PowerPoint. And we should just focus on the two um, intervention, uh, training intervention, and use one as experimental one and one as a comparator. In this case, uh, again, there are different ways to realize the data. The proper way here should be actually use a covert adjust analysis, which will have required me to have uh, raw data, which I don't have. So we use, I would say, a much more naive approach, forgive me which I will try to compare the difference in chain score between the intervention. Okay, so I extracted the data also using the supplementary information reported on PIRS1 to create uh, a effect sites for the between intervention different and built around that effect site a 95% confidence interval for the difference. Um, Actually, uh, from the, this first graph, I plot everything in dot plot, you can already see that, uh, yeah, the two interventions are indeed not different. There is no superiority of one intervention toward the other, because actually the point estimate is actually is very close to the mid on the zero effect, and the confidence interval is very wide. So actually, the uh, author was perfectly right to not <laughs> declare any intervention different from the other. However, when we analyzed the trial from an equivalence perspective, we should see that uh, uh, the confidence interval built around the point uh, estimate of the between uh, uh, intervention difference for the two max is kind of large. When you say how much large, uh, we cannot uh, say it's too large at this point, because again, we didn't uh, pre-specify equivalence margin, which would have been supposed the practice when you conduct uh, um, equivalence testing, but we can uh, judge, quantify uh, the, um, the confidence interval according to its numerical meaning. We saw here, for example, then the, the confidence interval goes up till uh, 2 minus 2 minus 2.5, probably even minus 2.7 milliliter per kilo per minute of U2 max. What does this mean? Well, it doesn't take much check on literature that uh, we can observe that uh, Several uh, researchers also found that only one milliliter per kilo per minute change in V2 max equals to a 9% uh, reduction in the risk of mortality. 
Again, I don't want to make the presentation too much complicated. I'm not a fan of standardized minimal clinical important difference because I recognize the importance of uh, um, different uh, uh, characteristics for different samples. We cannot just fix an MCID for all individual, but <laughs> it's also true that in this case, we are not discussing about a one milliliter per kilo per minute, but we're discussing about almost three. And depending a posteriori, a such a large uncertainty around the point estimate is hard. And that's the reason why I don't think we have enough evidence to declare that the two interventions are equivalent from a um, view to max perspective. So now we can ask questions, what should we do? I just, I, I said that I, I won't have criticized this article, but apparently that's what they do, not at all. Because now it's start the interesting part. We fail to establish superiority, we fail to establish equivalence, but we can still uh, test or at least investigate for inferiority, which is actually probably the most appropriate uh, approach considering the advantages of SIT comparing to uh, classic aerobic training in terms of time saving. And what we should do to test for inferiority. Again, first step, we should identify uh, critical comparator of established efficacy. Here, we don't have much margin of choice because uh, the author already decided the comparator. But in this case, it happens that the moderate continuous intensity training happens to be one of the most investigated uh, training intervention in all sports science. And there are several meta-analysis, also kind of update meta-analysis that have already uh, show that at least in untrained population, uh, performing uh, a classical, aerobic uh, training uh, program improve you to max compared to do nothing. Uh, I won't focus on all these details of meta-analysis because I don't agree with all these details and that interpretation is a meta-analysis. I just want to use it to show you that this meta-analysis has already show, has already provided an effort estimate in terms of point estimate and confidence interval. I will use the latter one to um, determine my non-inferiority margin from this work example. So I will, um, yeah, sorry. I will uh, set my non-inferiority margin, uh, subtracting the lower confidence interval to the metanalytic um, effect estimate, which gave me a value of 3.5 milliliter per kilo of minutes. I will superimpose that margin on the dot plot, like this, and I will perform a visual investigation which I guess may be more intuitive for most of the people who are not familiar with uh, this sort of design. I are not much uh, a fan of, uh, of formulas and, and so on. This visual investigation already clearly tell us and show us that once we perform all the calculation that I show, all the steps that I show, sorry, and we aim for an inferiority um, hypothesis, we can actually conclude that uh, uh, SIT is non inferior concert, um, compared to MCIT. And it's actually not a trivial finding, because actually, I think uh, uh, this is perhaps the most important finding we could have found or I would have liked to test when performing the studies. This non inferiority uh, finding uh, might uh, open several lines of researches which might investigate if. Uh, differences in uh, um, seat uh, protocols, changes in seat forms might maintain this non-inferiority. And this, again, according to the premise I made earlier, might open uh, this, uh, um, the use of this approach to a broad part of the classical untrained population, which is not willing at all to spend hours in jogging per week to get any uh, health benefit, although they are perfectly conscious about the importance of physical activity for health. Okay, uh, I almost at the end of this presentation. I hope to have not been too much pedantic uh, nor too much quick uh, in speaking. A uh, couple of consideration. I try to be as simple as possible to facilitate the understanding of the topic, which I'm perfectly aware is complex, at least it was complex and uh, mind-blowing for me at the beginning. Again, there is plenty of material 
especially from biomedicine and experimental technology that you can read to get a deeper perspective on the topic for those of you who are interested in it. And of course, hopefully also a nice review and useful review for response science. Thank you very much. And don't forget one important point, keep calm and PLSD05. Thank you. Thanks so much, Raphael. It was a really interesting talk. Um, I am conscious of time as well, so we'll get straight to the questions. I do have a couple of questions myself, but there was some coming up there in the chat, so I'll get to those first. But if anybody would like to ask a question, feel free to um, unmute yourself um, or put a hand up if you'd like. So one of the questions in the chat is about the testing for equivalence similarity. Is it the same like testing for the evidence of a null effect from a Bayesian approach? I think that through Bayesian stats, you can prove or have evidence for the null model compared to an alternative. So are these two the same or are they different? Well, actually, I have to make a premise that I wrote my review mostly from a frequencies perspective. You might is actually the first or the second thing I've wrote in the limitation of my review. I have not much knowledge into Bayesian statistics, and that's actually one of the reasons why I focus my review from a frequencies perspective. So I cannot actually provide you a strong reply to you. Uh, yeah, again, this is, was mostly based on controlling error rates. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Not at all. I, I guess um, there is a lot, a lot of work from Lacan's that uh, also encompass uh, uh, Bayesian approach or at least the implementation of Bayesian prior when uh, based yeah. your your decision on about the equivalence. Okay. And the next question from the chat was, um, can we use G power to do power calculations for equivalence tests as normally that's used when we perform traditional null hypothesis significance testing? You can for equivalence, but you have to split uh, uh, the power of the two tests individually. You have to uh, perform one one side test against one margin, and another another side test one side test against the other margin, which basically means just perform just power the the the, the study actually inferential test for the the lower margin. Yeah. Or so you would. Yeah. You would divide your alpha then, is what you're saying. Yeah, you actually, to the best of my knowledge, I use SAS, I don't use much G power, but there was an option to select your alpha and you basically uh, select, sorry, your alpha, also your 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 side, two side or one side. Yes, you just yeah. like power the inferential test for a one side hypothesis against the smallest margin. Oh, oh yeah, against the smallest margin, okay. Perfect. And there is a helpful paper that Michael has just put into the um, chat about null effects with Bayes factors and equivalence tests. So thank you for that, Michael. Um, the next question we have from the chat is if authors had pre specified one met um, three milliliters per kg per minute as the uh, the minimal clinical difference, so this is referring to this um, sprint paper, would it be reasonable to state that equivalence exists for the two protocols? I'm not sure if I understood well. You mean if you specify a margin that is very large, like 3.5 milliliters? Yes, yeah, I guess so. If the bounds were that large, then I guess uh, they would. Uh, we discussed uh, a lot before writing the paper about that. We didn't reach an agreement because from that standpoint, uh, uh, experimental psychology and the clinical research differ a lot. Like probably some of you already are uh, aware, experimental psychology has different methods to um, investigate equivalence. They have even a method in which you uh, Pre specify the margin according to your resources based on feasibility, pretty much like you specify uh, your uh, and power of, of your study in a classical yeah. uh, superiority test. And then, if you start, which basically means also pre specifying very large uh, margin, but to the extent that uh, uh, you, you are consistent uh, in your inferential analysis with the margin you pre specify, it's fine to declare equivalence within those margins. And then you can use this evidence to build a line of average in which you increase the resources and test uh, uh, always uh, uh, across smaller margins. That's what uh, one of the approach that I implement in a social and behavioral uh, science or epistemic psychology, which might, yeah. fit, uh, which, which might provide a positive answer to your questions. On the other hand, clinical research, especially uh, those who involve the, the drugs approval for obvious reason is much trickier. And actually, as I said, they don't even allow you 
to choose the method to define equivalence margin, they actually provide you, depending on percentage of absolute value, certain range that you have to test against. But yeah, again, unless I guess the difference uh, depends uh, on the impact of the finding uh, on, on humans. Yeah. Uh, when it I comes to that, drug, yeah. I guess kind of related to that, like, are there are there methods out there um, that would that you should use to adjust for you know your smallest effect of interest or adjust for your equivalence bounds because of publication bias in the research and you know uncertainty around the effect size i know that in the paper and in your talk there you mentioned for non-inferiority tests of using the lower bound confidence interval um and i suppose that can sometimes result in you know sample sizes that are quite large and might not be very feasible to recruit for people but are there any kind of specific methods um, that you know of for, you know, for maybe adjusting equivalence bounds or your um, your smallest effect of interest? Mm. You know, so, for example, would you use would you recommend using um, a kind of a meta analytic effect size that has, been, you know, undergone some processes of um, bias correction rather than um, a effect? by one individual paper? Well, the point is there are actually two problems with both these approaches that, uh, again, this past almost a year, but I remember we discussed it, uh, we didn't reach an agreement uh, on a perfectly best corrected approach for meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. Apparently, uh, to date, uh, we have several approaches to identify and even nominally correct for bias. Yes. We have many of them which aim to correct for bias but uh, we are not 100% uh, sure none of them is effective in providing uh, an unbiased FX size estimate. This mm -hmm. is, uh, it was a big topic, which might require several <laughs> hundred minutes. On the other hand, uh, if you aim to establish your, uh, or to take information from one single well-conducted study to design your, to determine your no inferiority or equivalence um, um, limit, uh, you have two uh, problems. One, which is actually the uh, amplification of the, of, of, the, of the other one. The first one is that uh, any study will never reach uh, the, I guess, at least to my knowledge, the sample sites, uh, uh, the cumulative sample sites of meta analysis. And mm -hmm. the other point is that uh, I don't want to speak bad about our field, at least about my field, but we are in sports science. And compared to clinical researchers, we uh, don't see those uh, 800 uh, uh, participants per group per every, uh, for every phase three trial and so on. But sometimes we struggle with eight, if you take as a go now, 15, 20, when is, it goes well, individual. And this basically means that although you, may, you conduct a very good study, the point estimate you will observe will have a very large uncertainty and which we, my, my bounds in further replication studies. So my recommendation is, uh, actually my point is that there are limitation on both approaches. Honestly, uh, if I have a well-conducted meta-analysis, uh, I will go for well-conducted meta-analysis because we already know, we know perfectly that meta-analysis have several problem, especially concerning the, for example, the 5 one effect and things that are not directly related to the meta-analysis, but rather to the fact that some evidence never reach uh, the public, but are still today the best uh, level of evidence we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I will say if you have a, a strong meta-analysis, which is well conducted, go for uh, that, that effect. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so we've time for one final question, and there was one left in the chat, and it is, how many non-inferiority inferiority trials are you aware of in sports science? Are the secondary outcomes typically analyzed in an NI fashion as well that would likely need many pre-registered NI margins? Uh, say again the, last, the second question. Are the secondary outcomes typically analyzed in a non-inferiority inferiority fashion as well? Um, well, I understood now. Uh, it depends because actually I didn't have time in this presentation. To, I could have, but it would have been too much complicated and comprehensive. You can read the, that that discussion in, in, in the review. Actually, you 
can perform a, a superiority test even in, in a non-inferiority study when you prove non-inferiority on your main outcome. This is called closed testing procedures. When you uh, establish non-inferiority, you might actually testing for superiority. So even within the same outcome, of course, mm -hmm. this uh, um, pattern of testing is uh, mostly uh, in a single direction. It's, it becomes hard to justify the opposite direction. And yeah, in, this is true within the outcome and also between the outcome. You don't have to design a study which is non-inferior on all the outcome you're going to investigate. Generally, what people do is power as the, the design a study and power it for the main outcome outcomes in a non-inferiority setting. Uh, secondary or tertiary outcome that are exploratory by definition might simply uh, investigate with a classical uh, superiority uh, approach, especially because mm -hmm. uh, uh, tertiary outcome I often use not as a confirmatory outcome, but just to generate hypothesis that will be tested in future study. So to answer pragmatically and quick, no, the fact that you decide to uh, test uh, non-inferiority on your main outcome doesn't limit you at all to test superiority on other outcomes. Yeah, of course. Okay. Great. Um, well, if there aren't any more questions, I'm just going to stop the recording.